Let me start out by introducing myself. My name is Roberta Anding, and I work in adolescent and sports medicine at Texas Children's Hospital, where my primary practice is taking care of young people from 11 to 22. So where I'm going to concentrate my nutrition messages for that age group. I also teach nutrition at Rice University, and I am the dietitian for the Houston Texans. So I get to take care of little kids and big kids, big kids. really big kids, <laughs> really, really big kids. So um, I'm honored to be here with you this morning and, and happy to share some, some information with you. I want you to brainstorm with me a little bit. What do you think are the biggest nutritional problems of adolescence? So we're going to start out with the problems and then go back to the basics because the problems are going to cloud the way we approach the basics. What do you think the problems, nutritional problems that we see in young people are? Okay. Portions. Oh, that's my favorite. What else? Can you think of anything else? The lack of variation. Okay. Because once we identify the problems, then we got to come up with the solutions. We got to come up with the solutions. What else? Too much sugar. And if I'm going to if I'm going to put medical terms behind some of these problems, I have to tell you, this terrifies me. And and my prejudice is, as a society, we do not have enough dollars to take care of the health care problems that that are coming. I look at the the wave of obesity in the United States just like a tidal wave, and the group that's getting the heaviest, the fastest, are six to eleven year olds. In fact, that age group has doubled in the, in the incidence of obesity in the last 20 years. It has doubled. So if we don't get a handle on it, we will have a generation of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease that we can't take care of, that we can't take care of. So obesity. Another problem that we'll spend some time talking about is osteoporosis. And you think osteoporosis in pediatrics, it's coming for some of the reasons why you told me for some of the reasons why you told me. Osteoporosis, diabetes, heart disease. Now, if I'm educating kids, you know what? They're really not terribly concerned about these because what happens? Who gets these diseases? Old people. And you know, old people is taking on a new definition. I used to think 30 was old, now I'm saying 80 is old. As my age goes up, the, my definition of older is, is changing. But let's talk about junk food, uh, sugar, and fat. One of the problems that we see in pediatrics is that we oftentimes are under the assumption that if we let kids self-select their diet, they'll get the nutrients that they need. And that really isn't the case. If you let kids have free access to food, they are going to load up on those top three items. They're going to load up on that. And we think of junk food as what? How do you define junk food? Anything that is fried, uh, just fast food. Fast food. Anything fried, like high in fat. Or so, something that has minimal nutritional value. So it could be, it could be gummy bears. It could be fun fruits. It could be, because these things have really little minimal nutritional value. So when we look at what our kids are eating, it has changed dramatically since 1950. And one of the things that is striking to me is that when McDonald's came out in 1950, they had one size of a hamburger. And I remember when McDonald's was in my neighborhood, and I thought this is the best thing ever. They had one size of a hamburger and one size of french fries. And that french fry serving was 210 calories. Now if I go get a supersize or order of fries, it's 610 calories. So it's not only that kids are getting more junk food, it is the portions of junk food that have become normal. So one of the ways that I like to teach portion control to kids is I go out and buy a supersize order of french fries and I pour it on a dinner plate. And I will tell you, it mounds the dinner plate. It mounds it, it is the whole dinner plate. But we don't eat our french fries out of a box, do we? I mean, out of, on a plate. We eat them out of the box. We eat them in the car, and we lose track of portions. Same thing with the big grab bag of chips that are so popular. The big grab bags, they're 500 calories, by the way. They're 500 calories. And if I take that bag of chips and dump it on a plate, it is the whole plate. 
So it's not so much that junk food hasn't been around because it really has been. But it's the portion sizes and the frequency by which kids are consuming it that is terrifying to me. When I look at the number one reason in our clinic why I see kids that are gaining weight faster than I can stop them, it's soft drinks. It is soft drinks. I had one young lady who was homeschooled say, I don't understand why I'm gaining weight. So I took her diet history and I asked her what she ate. And if you heard what she ate, it really wasn't very much. It was like a slice of toast for breakfast, some fruit at lunch, and then a, a small dinner at night. So it didn't fit. And so I asked her, what did she drink? And it turned out to be the equivalent of 15 soft drinks a day. <laughs> so 15 soft drinks is about 2,200 calories. Um, every Thursday afternoon, I am fortunate enough to be over at Austin High School which is right across the way from um, University of Houston, Baylor has a teen clinic there. And that is my standard advice. That's what these kids are doing. They're loading up on sugared beverages. And so when I talk about interventions to cut the sweets, if I can get kids to not drink sweet drinks, no soda, no sweet tea, and we'll talk about ways to do that, no sweet tea, no lemonade, no fruit punch, no Kool-Aid, and I will even say, and I've changed my mind over the last 10 years, no juice. No juice. I want them eating real fruit. I don't want them loading up on juice. Ounce for ounce juice has the same amount of calories as does soft drinks. Now there's more nutrition obviously packed in that, but the portion sizes that I see kids drinking are out of control. Another exercise in, in terms of portion size that I like people to do is bring in one of your glasses from home. Bring in one glass that you drink out of at home and see whether or not it's an average serving size. I have no juice glasses that are four ounces in my house. Now, my grandmother does. You know the tiny little juice glasses that your, your grandma had? That's a serving of juice. The smallest glass I have in my, my house is 10 ounces. The glass that my children drink out of is 16 because I've measured it. So this portion size, out of control portion size, this super size, if I can get something for 29 more cents, really kind of fits in with the American way. The average super size meal at McDonald's, Burger King, wherever you're going, is between 1,500 and 2,000 calories. It is huge. It is absolutely huge. The fast food meal that I got as a kid going to McDonald's, the hamburger, the 210 calorie order of fries, and a six ounce soft drink, was about 700 calories. Any of us can work 700 calories into our meal plan. None of us can work 1,500 to 2,000 calories in a meal plan. So it's portion sizes that have gone wrong. And you can use simple um, everyday tools to teach portion size. I like the size of the palm of my hand. When I talk about portion sizes to people, I say a serving is about the size of the palm of my hand. The size of a deck of cards is a, an approximate serving size. That's approximate. Now, when I work with the Texans, I said, the, the size of the palm of your hand. I said, no, let's make it the size of the palm of your hand. So that way, everybody has this gauge to say, OK, what's my serving like? Am I too much? Am I too little? What is my serving? So when George Bush said he didn't like broccoli and would eat a stem, well, a stem isn't going to be the size of the palm of your hand, is it? You know, a bite isn't the size of the palm of your hand. So this is a really great way to teach portion size because everybody has it. If you say eight ounces, six ounces, nobody knows what that means. Nobody knows what that means. If you say a hamburger patty should be about the size of the palm of your hand or the size of a deck of cards, you're really getting people into something that is visual. When we talk about things like rice or pasta that's a little bit stickier, you can say the size of your fist or the size of a tennis ball. And so you can get household objects at home and teach portion control. When we talk about the serving size of cheese, it's the size of a domino. A domino. Really? It's that small. So when someone says, oh, I really like cheese, and you say, well, how many domino slices are you having? I say, oh, no, I'm eating cheese the size of a deck of cards. You know, then you're really having someone who's getting a significant amount of calories from cheese. So it's not so much that, um, again, from my point of view, certainly we've had an influx of these kinds of foods into our food supply, but it's the portions that our kids are eating and what they consider norm. It is what they consider norm. I had a young lady in clinic the other day, and she, she has type 2 diabetes. She's 14 years old. 
She is coming home from school in the afternoon. Her mom said, well, she's tired when she comes home. Isn't it reasonable for her to sleep two or three hours, take a nap? And I said, no, it isn't reasonable at all. And when I took a history from her on what she was eating, it was chocolate milk and kolaches for breakfast, pizza and chips and soda for lunch, comes home from school exhausted in the afternoon, and then when she wakes up from her nap, would eat maybe 15 or 20 cookies. And she, she was real disappointed that I didn't have any magic for her other than I need to cut back on your portion sizes and I need you to get off your rear end and move. And her mom said, but, but she's tired. And I said, she's 14. She's 14. She needs to get up and move. She needs to get up and move. So it's the portion sizes and the unbelievable sedentary behaviors that I see in adolescents that even I've been practicing 25 years, the last five years has been stunning to me on what people consider to be norm. And these kinds of habits, the junk food, the increased sugar, the increased fat, are getting all of us, as Americans are getting all of us. I think it's helpful to teach label reading if you feel real comfortable reading labels. Because there are some things on labels that are a little bit tricky. And let me give you an example. And we'll come back to our, our other page in just a minute. If I'm looking at a glass of milk, if I'm looking at the, the nutrition facts label for a glass of milk, a glass of milk will say serving size 8 ounces, and in that 8 ounces there's 12 grams of carbohydrate, 8 grams of protein, and 8 grams of fat. This is whole milk. Or the kids tell me red top milk, the good stuff. That's what this looks like. If you get down to the bottom, it will say sugars, 12 grams. And the, the misconception that a lot of people have is that they've added table sugar to milk, and they haven't. Sugars are two carbohydrate units stuck together. So lactose, which is the primary carbohydrate in milk, is a sugar. So if you're comfortable understanding that, and you're looking at this and saying, you know, let's talk a little bit about milk sugar. It, it, it can clarify. Same thing with yogurt. If you look at a carton of yogurt, yogurt's going to have the predominant carbohydrate is going to be sugar. Some of that may be the table sugar the manufacturer sweetened it with, and the other part is going to be the 12 grams that naturally come in milk. If I'm looking at a can of peaches, even peaches in their own juice, it's going to tell me that a serving size has 15 grams of carbohydrate. That is all sugar. It's all sugar happens to be natural fruit sugar, but it's all sugar. So when I talk to kids about label reading, they'll say, but Miss Anding, you're telling me that sugars are bad for me. And so you have to feel comfortable with label reading. The two things that I, I like people to take a look at on the label is the serving size. Because manufacturers have gotten to the point where they will tell you two servings on a bottle. A, a bottle of juice, they'll say two servings of lemonade and you look at it and say, well, the bottle of lemonade's got 150 calories. It's 150 calories per serving. The serving sizes in that bottle are two. Otis Spunkmeyer muffins, the big muffins that you get, the serving size is a half a muffin. OK, now come on. If you're eating an Otis Spunkmeyer muffin, you're not eating half of it. You're eating the whole muffin. So then you have to double that. And an Otis Spunkmeyer muffin has over 40 grams of fat per muffin. They're so high in calories, that is a meal replacer. If you're going to eat an Otis Punk Bar muffin, that is a meal. Because there are so many calories, because the portion sizes are maybe two, and in some products, three. One of my favorite uh, label teaching exercises is go to the sugar-free diabetic candy aisle and look at some of the candies. And it will tell you, you know, like the big chunk bars of chocolate. You look at the, serve, you look at the calories, and it says 60. You think, well, this is great. You know, this is a low calorie food. And then you look at the number of servings in that candy bar, it's seven. <laughs> seven. And so now, seven times 60 is 420. I got news for you. You're better off buying the cheaper Hershey bar for 250 calories versus the 420 <laughs> diabetic one. So you can be real creative with label reading as long as you have some basics. What I like people to focus in on is this right here how many grams of fat in that serving? And then on the facts label, how much of that is saturated fat? Saturated fat is the kind of fat that contributes to heart disease. And the bad news is one out of two of us in this room is going to die from heart disease. 
More people die of heart disease in this country than they do breast cancer, than they do really all cancers combined. It's the number one killer of people in the United States is coronary disease. And so if I'm teaching something that I want my kids to know, if they're going to eat, for example, some kind of dessert, a cookie, ice cream, I want them to look at that fax label and pick the ones that have the lowest saturated fat content. But saturated fat is what, it, what I like people to pay attention to. American Heart Association says less than 30% of our calories need to come from fat. So if in this glass of milk has 150 calories, fat has 9 calories a gram. 9 times 7, I mean 8 times 9 is 72. So what percent roughly of the calories in milk come from fat? 50%. If you do the same thing with 2% milk, and this is a great teaching exercise, if you do the same thing with 2% milk, you're going to get 36% of those calories are coming from fat in 2% milk. So 2% milk by American Heart Association definitions is not low fat. I don't call 2% low fat milk, I call it reduced fat. It is reduced, it's not low fat. It is not low fat milk. And so when people say, well I'm drinking, I'm drinking milk, but I'm drinking 2% milk, that's so much better. Well it really isn't. It really isn't. So part of, of understanding labels is do I understand the marketing? Okay? Do I understand the marketing associated with food products? And manufacturers obviously want kids to buy their foods and they want parents to buy the food and they're relying on the fact that most people can't read a label. And so you can look for and teach the word OSE. So if it's dextrose, maltose, lactose, sucrose, that's all sugar. So when you're trying to decipher all the chemistry on the label, and that's what really it is, it's become chemistry on the label, it's not things you recognize as food, OSE means sugar. OSE means sugar. And I really like teaching that concept because then you don't have to know all the, because if you're talking to third graders, third graders aren't going to understand what um, modified corn syrup is, and they're not going to understand some of these other products, but if they see high fructose corn syrup, they're going to say, oh, well look, here it is. And so they can be nutrition detectives. They can be nutrition detectives, and you can take a label, photocopy it, and play nutrition detective and say, let's, let's take a look at this label. What do we want our kids to know from these labels? We want them to know portion size. We want them to understand this. And for older kids, they can certainly do the math, and you can use that as an exercise. Again, a low-fat food is less than 30% of calories from fat. So unless it's less than 30%, it's not really a low-fat food. It doesn't fit the definition of heart healthy. And so you can incorporate math as well as science into one exercise and have them kind of decipher that label. Okay, so label reading I think is an important part of understanding what's going on with this top one. Portion sizes I think we've addressed. Lack of variety is pretty impressive to me. You have, when I go to Austin High, I joke with my graduate students, I don't even have to take a diet history because I know what these kids are eating. It's nuggets, fries, a white roll, and red fruit punch. That is the diet that I'm seeing. The dilemma is 85 to 90% of the kids at Austin High are below the federal poverty line. And so those kids are on reduced and free lunch. So it's not reasonable for me to say, you know, bring your lunch from home because that isn't going to happen. It's not going to happen for these kids to bring their lunch from home. So we have to make better bad choices. And that's what I call it, we're making better bad choices. The problem that I also have is that when they go through the hot food line, the portion sizes are so unbelievably huge that the kids are eating huge portions of lasagna or huge portions of something else. And most of the kids, as you probably know from your school experiences, are going to the fast food line. So I would rather have them get a hamburger and a piece of fruit than I would them getting nuggets and fries. If I can get them away from things that are fried, the hamburgers are not the leanest in HISD, but it is a better bad choice. And again, that's what we call it, a better bad choice. What is your better bad choice? And how do I make a good choice at Austin High? Now many times when they check out, there's nice baskets of fruit, and they can get a couple pieces of fruit and a sandwich, and staying away from that sweet drink that we talked about, getting rid of the fruit punch. If they learn that kind of information at school, that there's simple things that they can do, well, you know, I can drink water instead of drinking fruit punch, I can cut back on the amount of Coke that I'm drinking. Maybe I'm drinking five a day now. Maybe I can get it to three. If I can get kids to cut back and not necessarily eliminate, long term, it's going to pay dividends. Short run, it isn't. 
Long term, it's going to pay dividends if I make permanent dietary changes, and that's what I'm looking for. The lack of variety, I don't really, I, my experience is it's not related to poverty. It's not related to poverty, it's related to convenience. It's related to convenience. I have many, many families that are below the, the poverty line that go to the farmer's market, and I will tell you, the produce there is so inexpensive that you can get a 25-pound bag of beans for about $4. So it's, it's a great place for people to shop. The problem is the convenience. I need the convenience. And so one of the things, one of the strategies when I talk about variety, and I really like this in terms of teaching healthy fat habits, again, something you can bring from your home. You bring a dinner plate, draw a line down the center, and half of that plate must be fruits and vegetables. Half of it must be fruits and vegetables. So I say, you get half the plate, and I get half the plate. Half the plate that's mine, I want fruits and vegetables, and I want you to try something new every week. It doesn't necessarily have to be fresh, but let's say you only eat corn. That's the only vegetable that you eat. Well, your assignment now is, next week, in addition to corn, I want you to try green beans, or I want you to try green peas. And it's impressive, the number of vegetables that kids don't eat, and the vegetables they've never heard of. The vegetables they've never heard of. Things like turnip greens and mustard greens and things that kids will say, oh yeah, I've heard the name before, but no, I've never had those at home. I've never had those at home. I think if you look at the way we were raised and probably the way our grandparents were raised, that was a staple in most people's households is that uh, you know, for Sunday dinner, you not only had your ham and whatever else you had, but you had vegetables with your meal. We don't have that any longer. We don't have that. We've gone to more of the junk food, the fast food, the processed and the instant, and how can I quickly get things on the table? The people who I've, my experience tells me don't do this are the families that I have that are first generation from Central and South America because they're not Americanized. The more Americanized you get people, the more lack of variety they have. So I say, you know, eat what your mom's fixing at home. Stay away from Jack in the Box. Stay away from the other places. What your mom's fixing at home is great. The other half of the plate should be a meat and a starch. And again, our portion size is dictated by the size of the palm of your hand. So if your mom is making enchiladas for dinner, well, maybe I could get an enchilada, maybe two, depending on how creative I am with the size of the palm of my hand. Maybe two enchiladas, and for my starch, I'm going to have a little rice and beans. And then on the other half of my plate, even if my mom doesn't fix it, I can go to the pantry and open up cans of corn or green peas or applesauce or fruit cocktail in its own juice, but half of that plate should be fruits and vegetables. One, it takes care of the variety, and two, it also eliminates the amount of junk food and fat that I've got because I'm filling somebody up on fruits and vegetables. The average Texas adolescent eats less than two servings of fruits and vegetables combined a day. The choices they're making are what? They're bad, yes, they are bad. The choices they're making, the top popular choices of kids in Texas are french fries in terms of fruits and vegetables. French fries, potato chips, because technically they're potatoes and they kind of fall into that category, apple juice, and iceberg lettuce. Well, the last time I checked, none of those are nutritional heroes. None. <laughs> Zero. So not only are we not even close to the five-a-day campaign, we're not close to the five-a-day campaign. The choices that we make are puny. They're puny. And we certainly know that people who have a lack of variety and don't and eat the same foods all, all the time, those are the kids who get nutrient deficiencies. Those are the kids who have iron deficiency anemia. We see zinc deficiencies. I have seen um, vitamin C deficiencies in our, in our clinic. Um, we'll talk about calcium and osteoporosis. You know, we have nutrient deficiencies that we should not have in the United States given our abundance of, of food supply. So lack of variety is huge. I love it when schools have little gardens and kids can grow produce and you know, some vegetables and other things that they've never tried before. It's more likely that they'll try it in a big environment where there's lots of people and everybody's doing it than if their mom serves it at home. So food lessons that include foods that you've never tasted before. 
foods that you've never tasted before are really very helpful in terms of getting people to variety. Okay, we touched on obesity, and I will tell you that um, obesity is the number one public health enemy in the United States. If you, um, and certainly we don't have the ability to have PowerPoint in here, but if you go to the CDC website, the Center for Disease Control, the Center for Disease Control, cdc.gov, they have a map. It's a series of, of United States maps that from 1986 to 2001, it shows you the increasing percentage in every state of people becoming obese. And before 1986, most of the states were colored white. And then they went to light blue, meaning less than 10% of the population was obese. And then they went to dark blue, saying 15%. And if you saw the change in the colors of those maps, I love that. And the great thing about the CDC website is it's not copy protected. So if you have PowerPoint capabilities or if you've got technical support, you can go and download those maps and show them in your class. They have a wonderful presentation. And you can just type in obesity maps where it says to search. Type in obesity maps, and you get this great visual graphic of how we are becoming heavier and heavier. It is estimated by the year 2050, if we don't do something different than we're doing now, over 50% of individuals residing in a state are going to be overweight, 50%. If we don't do anything by the turn of the next century, 100% of us are going to be obese, 100%. So what contributes to obesity? Well, we've already identified some things. What contributes to obesity? Lack of activity. Lack of physical activity. And so what, what defines physical activity? Movement. Movement. Mm -hmm. So physical activity to teenagers generally means you sweat and your heart rate's up and your hair gets messed. Mm -hmm. and, you don't, and you don't like that. You don't want to do that. But yet they'll go dancing with their friends. Mm -hmm. So anything that gets them to move is physical activity. If it's dancing, if it's bowling, if it's window shopping at the mall, it is physical activity. It is physical activity. And we need to have at least 30 minutes of physical activity a day. Now, I have three children, and my kids always played sports after school. So in addition to their regular physical activity, they had two and a half hours of practice every afternoon. And I, I will tell you, they ate similar to their friends, probably a little better than their friends, but they were so physically active that they had trouble gaining weight, not the, the other way around. So when we look at what's getting us, we've identified portion sizes in junk food. The other huge thing is the unbelievable lack of movement, the unbelievable lack of movement. And there are all kind of creative ways that you can get people to move, very inexpensive things that you can do, and they really are inexpensive. They're about 75 cents a piece, is you can go online and order little pedometers. You can do jump ropes. You can do jump ropes, but the little pedometers where you count your steps, they're not very accurate for calories, but they are accurate for counting steps. And you can get them for about 75, 50 to 75 cents a piece if you order them wholesale, and they count steps, with the goal being 10,000 steps a day. You want 10,000 steps a day. So that means if you go out walking on the weekends, if you're going around the mall, you got to keep going. And kids like things that are gadgety. <laughs> They like things that are gadgety and kind of electronic looking, but the 10,000 steps is one way that you can get kids to move. Dancing, for a lot of the kids that I, I work with, they go home, their, their mom and dad are at work, they come home by themselves, and I don't want them walking out in their neighborhood. It isn't safe. But it is safe for them to go in their room when no one's home, blast their music as loud as they can blast it, and dance for 30 minutes. They can do that. It doesn't have to be traditional physical activity. It's anything that is not video games, that's not computer, that's not television. The other thing I'll have kids do is that um, they write a contract with me. And you can do the same thing. You write up a little contract and say, if you're wa watching UPN 20 when you come home from school in the afternoon, you have to do this in front of the television. You have to march in front of the television for that whole half hour. If you're going to watch television, march for 30 minutes. You march for 30 minutes. You don't lay on the sofa. You don't lay on the sofa with your bag of chips. You march. Something to get the kids to move. And when it's contractual, you know, I, John Doe, agree to walk for, uh, do steps for at least 30 minutes while I'm watching television, give them a little log that you create, very inexpensive. How many days were you able to do that? And then talk about reasons why. 
well, my brother called me a jerk, and you know he was teasing me because I was okay. Well, that's fine. How how are you gonna how are you gonna solve that problem? Because everyone, including everybody in this room, has a barrier to being physically active. Everybody in this room has a barrier to being physically active. We all work. We have jobs. We come home. We're tired. Mm -hmm. We all have reasons. Now we now that we know the reasons. Okay, what's the solution beyond that? Why is osteoporosis an issue in kids? Well, we got a couple real disturbing uh, statistics. Kids don't drink milk. The Got Milk campaign is a disaster. From a marketing standpoint, it's very cute. It has done nothing to increase dairy consumption in the United States. Nothing. Okay. Why do you think that is? What are your thoughts about that? What do you think? What do you hear? Or what are your beliefs about drinking milk? Now, some people can't. If you're lactose intolerant, if you're lactose intolerant. There's real good reasons not to, but we can talk about ways out of that. We can talk about ways out of that. Yeah, and what I hear from teenage girls all the time is they'd rather drink Diet Coke than milk because they think, well, why should I drink my food? But there's some nice, new, exciting research that people who take in dairy calcium, and remember, I work for Texas Children's. I don't work for the Dairy Council. Um, it, people who take in dairy calcium actually burn more fat if the calories are the same than people who omit it. And so now you see on the YoPlay yogurt where it says burn more fat, there's science to support that. So when you include dairy calcium as part of a weight reduction program, it really does help to change body composition. The science is a little, little complicated. It has to do with the way fats are processed in your body. But it really does work. So when people say, well, I don't drink milk because I'm trying to lose weight, I'll say that's exactly when you should try and that's when you should drink milk. But what kind of milk do I need them to drink? Skim, no whole milk, no whole milk. I will, the American Academy of Pediatrics says if you're over the age of two, you don't need whole milk. Under the age of two, you do. Over the age of two, skim milk. Now, the biggest barrier to skim milk is it tastes nasty, right? OK, but here's some tips that you can do to get kids to drink skim milk. First thing you can do is to have them get, have their skim milk, and you can do this in class, and add a cap full of vanilla. And Part of what we taste, we smell. So when the milk smells sweet, it tastes sweeter. It tastes sweeter. So you trick them with that little cap full of vanilla to about a quart of, of skim milk. I would rather have kids drink chocolate skim milk than whole white milk because it's still fat free. And I will go on record to any parent who'd say, why are you letting my kid put Hershey syrup in the milk? Because I'd rather have them get used to drinking skim milk that has that zero grams of saturated fat have a few extra calories from the chocolate syrup, maybe 50, 70 extra calories from the chocolate syrup, but it's not going to be the same thing. So you can have them add a little bit of chocolate to it. The other thing that you can do is to that um, half gallon of milk, you can add about a quarter of a cup of dry milk powder. The dry milk powder that you know your grandma used to make up milk and put it in the refrigerator with. And part of what we don't like about skim milk is the way that it looks. So when I add milk solids and shake it up, it looks whiter, if that's a correct word. It looks whiter. It looks different. And so our eye is telling us, hmm, it looks different. It tastes and smells a little bit sweeter. This isn't so bad. It isn't so bad. But I agree with you that you know, when you're not raised up on milk and you're drinking sodas, this is a new experience. This is a new experience. Um, adolescents need four glasses of milk or the, the calcium equivalent per day. Four. And what I tell kids is that um, you get one chance in your life to build a skeleton. And it's between the ages of 11 and 25. That's your chance. If you don't do it then, you can't play catch up. You can't play catch up. This is the one time. And I'm, I'm from Wisconsin, so I'm very glad that I'm from Wisconsin because <laughs> I drank tons of milk growing up. I drank tons of milk. So now that I'm almost 50, it's, OK, well, this is good. At least I've got the calcium. At least I put it in when I was a kid. What we're seeing now is children are consuming somewhere in the range of about 300 to 600 milligrams of calcium a day, half of what they need. They're consuming half of what they need. And I'll give you some calcium equivalents in a minute. They're consuming half of what they need. When you take the calcium away from dairy products, you're also taking away the vitamin D. And we've got some new data that suggests 40% of adolescents are deficient in vitamin D. 
Well, vitamin D not only helps to get calcium in the bones, vitamin D also helps to prevent colon cancer. And so when I look at the populations that have the highest amount of colon cancer in the United States, it's African Americans. African Americans, you know, unfortunately win that prize in terms of colon cancer. Well, who's lactose intolerant? Yeah. African Americans. Yeah. African Americans. And so if you're lactose intolerant, you're not drinking milk, the sun also makes vitamin D in your skin. The darker your pigment, the longer you have to stay outside. With the real concern for skin cancer, if I use sunblock, it blocks the conversion of vitamin D in my skin. So I will tell kids, even though I, I don't want you to have skin cancer, you need to be outside in the morning and have no sunscreen on. You need to get outside some time of the day and have no sunscreen on because you need to have that conversion of vitamin D in your skin. But with the increase of television and video games and computers, kids aren't outside. They're not outside. So not only are they not getting it from their dairy products, they're also not getting it from the sun. They're not getting it from the sun. So again, I'm a real big proponent of kids going outside in gym clothes for PE. When the weather's nice, get them outside for a variety of reasons. So where, where can we get calcium from besides milk? <coughs> Milk's got about 300 milligrams of calcium per serving. And there's a couple other places. Probably my, my favorite is, let's talk about milk first. If you're lactose intolerant, you can use something called lactaid. And this is a really nice, another nice little teaching tool. Lactaid is the enzyme that breaks apart that milk sugar that people who are lactose intolerant can't break apart. If you're lactose intolerant, what happens is that milk sugar, those two carbohydrate units, stay stuck together. When they get to your large intestine, the nice little bacteria that live there ferment it, and it gives you gas, cramping, bloating, and diarrhea. Okay? Lactaid is the enzyme that breaks that apart. Well, when I go from a two sugar unit to two individual pieces, the milk gets sweeter. It gets sweeter. So a nice thing to do is to have people taste it at the beginning and then taste it after you put the lactate drops and you can say, well, what's happening is as that lactate digests the milk, it's digesting the milk sugar, it is getting sweeter. So milk gets sweeter. Lactate milk is actually sweeter than regular milk because of the, it's already digested. So that's one thing that can be done. Milk's got 300 milligrams of calcium. I told you you need four a day. Cheese, bad news about 100 to 140 milligrams per ounce, and that ounce is that domino size. Ice cream less than that, okay? So if someone says, well, I'm eating ice cream, well, great. But most of us can't afford the calories in that amount of ice cream, so it's not gonna count. Probably the best thing out on the market now is calcium fortified orange juice. <coughs> now, I already told you I didn't want kids drinking a bunch of juice. But if I have no other option to get the calcium in, I'll count that as their fruit servings. Calcium fortified orange juice has the same amount of calcium as does milk. Same amount of calcium as does milk. So if you have someone who's drinking milk in the morning with their cereal, well, that's one. Maybe they have a couple slices of cheese on their sandwich at lunch, that's two. They come home from school and have a big tumbler of orange juice, now they've got four. They're calcium equivalents. But I tell kids it's the blue label. It's got to be minute made with the blue label because it'll say calcium fortified. It's calcium fortified. Calcium supplements, I don't recommend to kids because with calcium supplements, your body can't absorb 1,200 milligrams of calcium at one time, so you got to take it throughout the day. Well, I don't know about you, but the more frequently I got to take something, the more likely I am to forget. You know, if I have to take three pills a day or four pills a day, forget it. You know, it isn't going to happen. I'm not going to remember. I can barely remember where I parked my car, much less am I going to remember to take a, a bunch of pills. So it, it generally is a non-effective way of doing it. Okay? Diabetes and heart disease, both of them related to increasing weight. Um, I'm going to make you all advocates for diabetes um, awareness because I want you to do a couple things as part of, of your health teaching. You can oftentimes see the beginnings of diabetes on the outside. And part of it is where we carry our weight. If people carry their weight in their belly, they carry their weight in their belly, and we've all seen people who have a lot of upper back fat, a big abdomen, skinny behind and skinny legs, they have that kind of apple shape. If you're an apple, you're much more likely to have diabetes or heart disease than if you're a pear. Women who are pears, who have bigger behinds and bigger legs, 
that's more of an, uh, the way you want your body fat distribution. Diabetes in the skin, or pre-diabetes in the skin, and I know you all have seen this in kids, and maybe it's someone in your family, they have the real dark kind of ring around the collar. It's where the skin folds. Where the skin folds or bends, you see this real dark pigmentation. It's much more pronounced in African Americans and Hispanics and Caucasians and Asian Americans, but you can still get it. It's hyperpigmentation, too much pigmentation in the skin. Um, I had a girl in clinic, it was under her armpits, it was in her groin, it was where her arm bend was here and around her neck. And what she was, tr she came into clinic because she wanted to know what she could do to get rid of it. And she tried to scrub it off with a Brillo pad. It's in your skin. It's a melanin in your skin. Your skin just gets hyperpigmented. So if you see a kid who's got that real hyperpigmentation, and I'll give you my email at the end and I can actually send you some pictures so you can look at it. If you have that hyperpigmentation, it means that your body's working real hard to keep your blood sugars normal. Real hard to keep your blood sugars normal. And it's been estimated that in the HISD Galveston area, about 15 to 16 percent of our kids have that hyperpigmentation, which is kind of the, the beginnings of type 2 diabetes. Okay? So I want to make you diabetes advocates. If somebody does have type 2 diabetes, all the things that we've talked about work. The portion control, the increased physical activity. Type 2 diabetes is a disease of excess. Certainly, people inherit it. It's a genetic luck of the draw. If you're Hispanic, that is the number one um, disease of Hispanics is type 2 diabetes. So there is this strong, strong genetic link. But there's also environmental things that we can do to control it, environmental things that we can do to control it. The very scary thing to me is that once someone's diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, the complications appear 10 to 15 years later. So I'm seeing kids in my clinic that are 10 with type 2 diabetes. So the complications that we know of type 2 diabetes, the, the kidney problems, the cardiac problems, or the heart problems, the vision problems, are going to appear in people that are 20 to 25 years old if we don't become real diabetes. Um, everybody needs to be in this public health campaign to prevent and identify an early treatment of diabetes. Broccoli has a decent amount of calcium, but most of the calcium in vegetables, like in spinach, are bound to a chemical called oxalic acid. Mm -hmm. And so on paper, they're a great source of calcium. In your body, the calcium goes in one way and out the other because you can't absorb it. So broccoli of the vegetables is going to be the one that you can get some calcium out of. Spinach, it's zero. So it'll tell you a serving of spinach is 140 milligrams of calcium, and it is in the lab. It's not in your body. So calcium in vegetables is less reliable than calcium in dairy products or the new calcium fortified products. And so, you know, I don't look at that as something that most people could eat enough of those vegetables. And how many kids are going to eat pounds of broccoli? OK, there may be one. OK, there may be one child out there somewhere who's going to do that. But it's not, it's not common. It's not common. Iron deficiency, still a major concern. Um, iron deficiencies are common in people for the same key things that you identified when we started this discussion, lack of variety, lack of variety, people who eat you know, things like Pop-Tarts for breakfast in instead of eating fortified breakfast cereals, things like Cheerios and Rice Krispies and those kinds of things, fortified breakfast cereals, and certainly girls who are now having regular periods. Girls that are having regular periods lose iron every single month, and they play the catch-up game. They play the catch-up game, and unless their diet includes variety, including fortified foods like breakfast cereal and lean red meats, they're not going to get adequate amounts of iron. They're not going to get adequate amounts of iron. And so certain things, and again, I'm not trying to make physicians out of all of y'all, but certain things that you can do to kind of test yourself. You know the little creases you have in your hands? If you pull back, and of course I don't want you to break your fingers, but if you pull back and it blanches white, it blanches white. And I'll, mine don't blanch white. You can see the creases in my hand. When I pull back, they blanch, they, they show red. If they, and yours are red, if they show white, if you look at a, a child's hand and when they pull back, these creases in their hands become white versus red, chances are, it's not a specific test, but chances are they're more likely to have iron deficiency. Yeah, you, you look good. Okay? It's not a specific test. It's not, it's not like a blood test, but then you can, you know, you can do this, and if the pink portion of your eye is pale, so this is, these are little tests that kids can do themselves. You can do it in class. You can talk about where iron comes from. 
and you can say, now let's do a little test to see whether or not, again, it's not, it's not a diagnostic test, so you can't tell someone they're anemic, but the likelihood increases as that line blanches white and as the, the pink portion of your eye becomes paler. It, it, we use that in clinic all the time. I watch my doctors come back and when they're examining people, they're doing this and checking, and then if they, they blanch, we'll send them off and get some blood work done. We'll send them off and get blood work because, and again, a lot of the work that I do is community-based. It's not in Texas Children's Hospital, and so I don't have the availability of expensive labs and a clinic where they can draw blood. I've got to use my own clinical judgment, and I like this, these kinds of concepts because teachers can go out and do the same thing. Teachers can go out and teach the same concepts. So we covered a lot of ground, and I, I'm, you know, y'all did a very good job, a very good job of identifying what I consider to be the big dietary issues that we've got, and then I think we explored what the consequences of those dietary variables are. When you identify the dietary problems, then it, it makes sense to take a look at the diseases that come from those dietary problems.